Uh, so let's just recap the first side. What were the four traits of an awesome family? Playful. 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 Sorry? Encouragement. Encouragement. Encouraging growth. Protecting. Protecting. Serve God and others. Okay, playful, encouragement, protection. protection. I, drew, I drew a blank there. <laughs> and then uh, serving God and others. The next, uh, what we want to do over the next little while is now a strong family. So an awesome family, but we want it to be strong as well. And for a strong family, you need to have a strong foundation. Over the last 60 years or so, Unfortunately, we have been living in a society like there's a vacuum of, uh, of values. You know, in the 60s, anything goes. Anything goes. There was no boundaries. There's no, uh, you know, yes, there was truth. But nowadays, we're living in a society that truth doesn't really exist. Like, what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. And we're okay with that. Like, we're, we're talking yesterday a little bit more about, like, if I come up to you and I say, well, I identify myself as a microwave, uh, that's true for me and you guys can't, uh, it's not true for you and it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter what you think, what the truth is. And unfortunately, truth kind of has disappeared in, in our societies because everybody wants what's easy and what's convenient and what's practical for us in, in our values. So, but what we can agree on is that a foundation or a strong foundation is important and thousands and thousands of years ago God has given us like the big ten the big ten commandments and I kind of touched on it in the earlier topic that the ten commandments were given to us not in a way that uh, uh, you know to to restrict us but actually to release us from, from a lot of things. In Deuteronomy 6 and 7 it says, Never forget these commandments that I, have, that I have given you. Teach them to your children. So there's two things here. There's, we shouldn't forget about them. We ourselves shouldn't forget about the Ten Commandments. But at the same time, we need to learn to, to, to teach them. Most of us, I kind of said that we probably can't list off the Ten Commandments, but let's try. Like as a group effort, I think we're, we'll be able to, to do this together. I have a cheat note here because I don't know it off by heart. So, so let's see how many we could get uh, if we're together. Uh, sure, let, let's try and do them in order. If we can, that's another level up. If we can, then let's... Uh, what's, the, what's the first one? No other God but yourself. No other God but yourself, yes. But yourself, but no other God before, before me. Before yeah. me, yeah. No, you shall have no other gods before me. That's number one. Number two? No carved, no carved images. Perfect. Number three? Yeah. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four is what? No. No. Yes. Number four is keep the Sabbath. No. Number four is keep the Sabbath. Okay. Number five. Okay. <laughs> Parents know that one really well. Like, yeah, honor me. <laughs> So number five is honor uh, father and mother. Number six? Yeah, do not murder. Number seven? Adultery, yes. Number eight? Don't steal, yeah. Number nine? Don't bear false witness, yes. And number ten? Do not covet. Amazing, amazing. Well, that's, that truly is amazing. But I, I may just say it in order for a purpose. Because the purpose, like the order of uh, the Ten Commandments are not haphazard. They're there for a purpose. And what we're going to do is today is touch on the first one, which is the foundation. The foundation of like all our relationships, the foundation of our families need to be on this. You shall have no other God before me. And unfortunately this was all caps, but in the Bible, God's here is the lower cap G. So, uh, what could be a God? There's a principle here. There's a principle behind this 
first, first commandment? What's the principle behind it? Like if you were to sum this up, what is God saying? Anything that takes priority over Him. Right. Other words means, put me first. God is saying, put me first. In families, in relationships, put me first. This is what God is saying. If you look up on YouTube, bless you. If you look up on YouTube, Denzel Washington actually gave a speech to one of the universities, I think. It was a commencement speech. And he started off his speech by saying, number one, put God first. And his speech is really nice. Like It's about 10 minutes. I encourage you guys to go, go watch it. Uh, and actually, I just stumbled on it this morning. So I, like, I felt like I needed to share it. Like Even Denzel Washington is saying, like, put God first. And he's saying, he, he went on and he said, no matter how much we think that we have left God behind, He hasn't left us behind. No matter what. It doesn't matter what we, what we have done to God because God is always going to, to be there with us. And this is... A, a strong foundation. Everyone knows that a foundation is one of the most important things. Like the foundation of this house is not very good. Like you do not want to live in this house and you don't want your families to live in this house and you don't want your family to look like this house and it's all about foundation. Unfortunately foundation is something that you don't see very often. Like. If you build your foundation, if you're not building it properly, if you don't dig properly, if you try and cut corners on your foundation, it will be exposed at some point uh, throughout your life. The same way that this house is all crooked because of the foundation, like they cut a corner on the foundation, later on in life our families will suffer or will be exposed to a not, uh, not a good foundation. And the foundation of our lives is this, you shall have no other gods but me, before me before me. So what could be a God in our life? So what are the gods that he's talking about here? Love money. Money? Let's, let's name a few just so we're money. Work. Work. Drugs and alcohol. Drugs and alcohol. Electronics. Electronics. Perfectionism. Perfectionism. Social media. Social media, yes. Relationships, Relationships yes. Unhealthy. Yes, unhealthy, yes. What did you say? Family sometimes. Sure, if it's unhealthy uh, expectations from the family. Sure. Golf, sports. No, myself. Myself. So everything. Like we're talking almost everything. Like golf is not negative. I love, I love to play golf. Like we can't. So, but if I put this above all and I'm putting this before God, then what's happening is that I'm making golf a God. And some of us think that we're, you know, God's on the golf course, but like it's not. <laughs> the reality is, is that we're putting, we're putting God in a, in a second place. And, the, and I hate using the number, like put God first or whatever, but just for the purpose of today, because God is really like everything. I'm sure you've, maybe you've heard in the past, like God is not a slice of the pie. God is the filling. Like he's supposed to be entrenched in every area of our life. Families today in America, are dropping like flies. If you look at the stats of uh, of divorce, it's one. I think it was one in f uh, one in three families divorce. This is ridiculous. This is a ridiculous amount. In Canada, it's one uh, like it's 44 percent of marriages end in divorce, and that's a horrible stat. But there is a positive stat because when they dig into it a little bit more and they saw that okay, well, the the marriages that happened inside of a church. That stat went from uh, one to one in three to one in one thousand and one hundred. Like that's a big difference. So wouldn't you say like there's a lot more success when we are getting married in the church? Now, when I say get married in the church, it's not just physically you're in the church and you got married. I mean that you're a part of a church family and that you are uh, building that awesome foundation and the strong foundation that we were talking about. Why? Because they put God first. You pray together, your Bible together, you serve together. This is what's going to lead to a strong foundation and that the house will not come crumbling down like we, like, like we expect. Or like what is happening all around us, whether in Canada or in here. Unfortunately, marriages are being broken because we, we are not awesome families and we don't have that strong foundation. And we need to put that back into America. 
Like yesterday I was talking and there was a group of maybe 15 youth that were sitting there and we were talking about political correctness and tolerance in this and we spoke about you know the cause and the um, the cause, the cost of it and the cure of it. And at the end we said that the cure was them. That they are. And I, I was telling them like yeah you may seem that you are like 10, 15 people sitting in a room, what can we do in this big country? What effect can we do? You're, you're in the same room that the disciples were in when after Christ, uh, when Christ was crucified. Christ was crucified, what happened? The disciples fled and they ended up in the room and they locked themselves in a room. They were 11 guys in a room. And what happened? Christ appeared to them, showed them the wood, showed them how much He loved them and said, Put me first and don't worry about everything else. And what happened is those 11 guys ended up doing what? Preaching Christianity to the world. There's over 2 billion Christians because 11 people started. And we're saying a group of 20, 25 people that are sitting here are not going to have an influence like the disciples had? Why? Why do we think that we can't have that influence like the disciples had? We can and we will if we allow and we do this first and we put uh, the foundation first. What I wanted us to do, uh, and this is where the interaction will come, is I want us to take the word first and start to see which areas of our life that we, we should put God first in. And we'll take each letter, so there's five letters there, we'll pick five areas. Everyone will say what they think. F stands for. There's no right or wrong. Like, I have one, but like, uh, everybody, like, how we could practically put God first in our lives and in our families, starting with the letter F. You need to pick a word that starts with the letter F, and then I, and then R, and then S, then T, and then we'll have five different words that, w which areas of our life that we should put God first, and hopefully it'll stick. So, let's try, and then we could hear a bunch of different Fs, but, here's the, here's the caveat. Is that you're going to say it, you need to back it up. Okay? That doesn't mean stay quiet now. Because, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have said that. No, you just say the word and then I'll, uh, I'll ask more questions after that. But pick a word that starts with F, that where we're going to put God first in. So, for F, I vote for finances. I think uh, finances, uh, how we spend and save money reflects uh, what's really in our hearts. For example, if for the past month, I spent over $100 on Starbucks coffee. That really means uh, my priorities are not on my own. And, and that is true, by the way. I am being vulnerable here. Um, and that means I need to do something. And that money could be used elsewhere. Like, that's just futile. It's useless uh, investment. That's perfect. So, finance. Uh, and I want to, I want, I want to say like when you get it, you know how you get like the bonus points or whatever. If you get the one that I had, that's that's a bonus point. That's the one that I actually was thinking of, which was finance. So, but we're gonna we're gonna try and go through other ones. But I want to touch on finance a little bit here because finance, I personally hate to speak about finance like in churches, but the reality is is. We shouldn't shy away from speaking about it because it is one of the commandments. It is one, uh, it, it tells us to tithe. Now, uh, maybe some people think that it's not the right place, but the reality is, is we speak about tithing not in a way that the church needs the money. The church doesn't need the money. Uh, and you guys could all agree on that. You guys just bought a piece of land and you, you will see miracles. You will see miracles finance. You will understand. Money will come out of nowhere uh, when God wants to, to glorify His name. It's not my 10% that's going to make the difference. But it's my, temper, my heart that is willing to give the 10% that's going to make the difference. So it's not my 10%, but it's my heart that is willing to give it that's going to make the whole difference in this world. We are commanded to honor Him uh, and to love the Lord by giving back the first part of our income. This is what it was. It said in Proverbs: "Give the first part, uh, part of your income." You hear this a lot of times, like as the first fruits. Uh, and and some people take it more seriously than others. Like when they start a new job, some people will give their first complete paycheck. Some people will, you know, I don't know the. 
whatever it is, they'll, they'll give like a chunk when it's their first, if it's their first child, they, they won't give their first child away, but I'm like, I even know we want to, you know, like, somebody once told me, this is bad, but, uh, what was I, somebody once told me, uh, children are like pancakes, the first one comes out screwed up and the rest are okay, like, it's always like, <laughs> like, you always, but anyways, but it's not true, I, I love my oldest son, he's great, like, he's, He's amazing. But anyways, the first is so important. And giving tithe is, is important. Why? Because it is a form of worship. When you read into the Old Testament and when they're talking about tithing, they talk about tithing not only give your 10%, but it's also talking when you should give it. And it says on the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week? Sunday. Sunday is the day of worship. So tithing is an act of worship. Worship just means, like, we have this big thing, like, this word worship, and we think that it's like, you know, standing and raising our hands and praying and worship songs, and, and that's all great. But the word worship just really, deep down, means loving God. Loving God with all you got. And this is what we're called to do in terms of tithing. It is okay for us to to give to God. Do we give to God in sluggish times and when it's recession and houses are foreclosing and whatever? Yeah, actually, that's especially when you give. That's especially when you give because you give out of your necessity, not out of your abundance. So it's important for us to, uh, to tithe. So think about it. Like your finance is a big part of your life and it's okay for us to give that portion back to God because once we understand that everything comes from Him, then everything belongs to Him. Everything belongs to Him. I challenge you to be like courageous when it comes to your, to your finance. I understand that we, we might be tight and we, there might be times and this and that, but where you shouldn't cut is not, it's not your God. That's not where you cut from. You might cut from your Starbucks, but you don't cut from your God. And this is where we need to, to start to realize and take it a little bit more seriously when it comes to this. And it doesn't matter how much it is. It's not about the amount. I promise you. I have seen, I was um, in the previous church. Again, I hate finance. Like, I, I hate doing my taxes. I do my taxes, just in case somebody's listening. I do my taxes. I hate doing taxes. My wife has her own business, and like I handle like the 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 numbers and I, I just hate it I hate numbers but at the end of the day uh, where was I going with this completely forgot huh you were saying it wasn't the amount you were saying at the previous at your previous church yeah oh yeah yeah okay yeah oh yes thank you so I was just saying so I hate finance so one one time actually like I had to be the treasurer of, of the church. And I'm like God, like out of all the people of the church you're picking this bozo to be the, the treasurer, like come on. Like no. But at the end of the so I was and he did it for a purpose because it was a new church like this. And uh, and for some reason like I, I was like I was close friends with other treasurers of other church and all the advice that I always gave is like when it comes to service don't worry about it. If they come and ask the treasurer for money for a certain project, uh, for something towards the service, just say yes. Even if you don't have it, just say yes. Just say yes, and you'll see. And really, it became a time for me to kind of see God's hand at work. I am telling you, money was coming from God knows, God knows where. I really don't know. And every time you need, and not in excess, it's not like the church was mil a millionaire, it just, when the time was needed, that money came. And it was, why? Because we were faithful. The people were faithful. They believed, they gave with their heart, and that's what God wants. He just wants your heart. He needs your heart more than your, mo more than your money. It's an act of worship. Finance. F is for finance, but let's put, do we, want, do we have another F? Does somebody else have another idea for F? Go ahead. The first thing that came to mind was fasting. Okay. A hundred percent, yeah. Fasting is good. I was thinking at it a little bit differently. Sure. I was um I chose friends. Sometimes we put our friends first. Okay. Before we put God. We're so concerned about what our friends are gonna think, what do our friends have, how do they keep 
up with our friends, uh, that keeping up with the Joneses mentality, and mm -hmm. that we, you know, put aside and not be so concerned with what our friends have and be envious of them or want to keep up with them, but putting God first, making a special, being really, have a heightened alert as to what you're doing, mm -hmm. and that it, you know, and, and have decent friendships, but not have your focus and time be with your friends over your God. Okay, that's, that's good. That will fit somewhere else along the line too. If you think of another word, I'm sure it will fit, fit, on, fit in there somewhere. I'm thinking of fear, like we fear the future, the stability in jobs or whatever, but we should have fear of God first in our hearts. Fear of God, sure. Yeah, so that's one of the ways of putting God first, yeah? yeah more? Fatherly love, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead, Uncle. Fridays. Fridays? Fridays? Sure. If you go to work on Friday, you hear people say, Happy Friday. Oh. Any other day, not happy. Go out, we hang out, stay with us. Really, Friday is. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> Treat every day like it's Friday. Yeah. <laughs> You know, another thing about finance, I want to just go back to finance. All of these are, are really good. The finance, too, they always say, like, show me your, well, it was your checkbook, but now show me your visa statement, and I'll tell you where your priorities are. Like, where you put your money is, that's where your priorities are. Like, if I, I'll pick on Sandy, if I see Sandy's visa statement, chances are we're going to see Starbucks quite a bit on there. Right? And we'll know that she likes Starbucks over Dunkin' Donuts, even though Dunkin' Donuts is pretty good. No. Like, I'm just saying. Oh, we'll relax. <laughs> well, okay, we're done. I'm going home. <laughs> Find the... Uh, so first, finance and all everything else that we, we've said. What about for I? For I. I. Self, okay. okay so how do you, so let me, let me kind of, how do we put God first? Like, so we, we're looking for practical areas in our life that I could put God first. So like finance was like, okay, I want to put God first in my finance. What's, go ahead. Uh, your interests. <laughs> A lot of times we're more interested in developing or going back to first on our finances or developing uh, you know, something you want to do like golf, and we take off that Sunday to golf instead of you know going to church. But our interests, and general interests of everyday things, when I mean, you get to just stop on Sunday, just give thanks to, to God. A hundred percent. If I could ring the bell, then that would be the other one that's on there. Good job. So yes, that was the other one that that was written down, which was interest. Our interest, which means like yeah, everything. Sorry, remember your name? Brett. Brett. Yes. I want to call you Peter, but it's <laughs> Brett. Okay. Brett. Everything that Brett said is right. Like our fun time, our play time, our amusement time, our hobbies, our, create, our recreation, our pastimes, everything. Our interest is what we need to give to God. How do we do that? 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, whatever you do, do it all for God's glory. Or do it in the glory of God. Do it for God's glory. Does that include... Me going on vacation. Who's going to Mexico? Somebody's going to Mexico soon. Yeah. So going on vacation. Can I, can I have God? Can I put God in that vacation first? Yeah. There are ways. We're just talking recently. Somebody, we're just talking and we're saying like, if we just put a little bit of effort, just a little bit of thought into everything that we do and say, how can I include God? Or how can I put God first in this? There are many ways that will pop up in, in our hearts. And it's different for everyone, but there are ways. We just have to be willing and open enough to do that. So yes, our interests are definitely something. So whether it's I'm going sailing or golfing or fishing or whatever it is, I do it in a way that is with an attitude of gratitude. If I do it with an attitude of gratitude, then guess what? I'm putting God first in that. If I play tennis or if I go fishing and I say, thank you God for giving me an arm to throw a fishing rod or a fishing line or play tennis or play basketball or 
uh, thank you for my finance, you have given me the ability to go on vacation, like all of these things, we're back to giving thanks. Our church is a, thank, a thankful church. And this is how we are supposed to live it. We live it out in every aspect of our life that if you could show gratitude in, every, in all your interests. You know, so whatever we, we actually speak about is our interests. So are you able to have like a gathering at home and speak about whatever the, uh, the New Jersey Devils like hockey team or what's the baseball team, the Mets? like the Mets or this or that like can you have a conversation and kind of like somehow bring glory back to God are you able to steer the conversation in a way that you will bring God into that conversation a lot of times we don't even we don't even want to bring God in our conversation or we're, we're shy to do that why if you are interested in something you're gonna want to talk about it are you interested in God are you interested in how he's working in your life and in your family? This is what makes strong families, is by speaking and putting God first. If I truly love God with all my heart, I want to speak about him. I want to show, expose, uh, expose people to what he's doing in my life, not in a prideful way, but in a way that gives him glory. I, I'll never forget, I was about uh, 21, 22 years old, so just a couple of years ago, not very long ago. So, and then I, I was sitting in a Tim Hortons. So with Tim Hortons is the coffee shop in, in Canada. So we're sitting and then one of my friends, we've been, we just went and everybody's sitting around the table. We're having a great time. We're laughing and we're drinking coffee and whatever, just having, having a good time. And she did something that like blew my mind, which was, and it was something so simple. She pulled out a book. It was a spiritual book. And she said, hey guys, Let's just, I, I want to share with you, I just read this chapter. And she read a chapter of a spiritual book and our whole conversation switched to, to God. And why did she do that? Because she had so much interest in the book. She brought God's glory in to like another 10 people just by pulling out a book and reading a small chapter and turning that conversation. We weren't talking about anything bad. There was nothing wrong with our conversation. But it just took it to the next level. And that's like, that happened 20 years ago. And I still remember it to this day. And this girl, like, she's a regular girl. She serves the church and whatever. Like, she wasn't doing it out of being a show-off or being like, she's our teacher, whatever. She did it out of, out of complete interest. So there is a way to share and put God first in your interest. We just need to be open to that. First, finance. Second, interest. Third, are. I, I can say oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sure. Some, some people really say uh, intelligence enough to figure out everything. It doesn't mean God's hand give him wisdom through the eye. You're right. So they are smart enough to solve everything, to take care of everything. A hundred percent. Yeah. And, uh, God, so I'm smart. Yeah, and that that is very dangerous. A lot of smart people. And I had uh, uh, like someone very close to my family. He, he, he's a very smart person, but he, he was an atheist for years and years and years. Why? Because he was too, like, he was almost too smart. Like, he, everything was logical to him. And he wasn't willing to give any glory back to God until recently. Something happened to him recently. And uh, like, God really showed himself to him. And now he gives, like, he's, he's a changed man. And even he's still, the, he's still a smart man. He's not, he's not a dummy. Like he's still a smart man, but he gives that glory back to God. And it's important. Yes, you're right. Intelligence is a, is a very slippery slope for us. When we think that I put all the effort into studying and I put uh, all the effort into all these different letters that are behind my name and whatever. And that's great to have. And God is happy when he sees successful people uh, in it. But he's happier when we give that glory back to him when it comes to especially intelligence. So that one. In God we trust. In God we trust. Yes. In God we trust. I hope that you guys never get rid of that. I'm telling you, if it was up in Canada, that in God we trust would have been gone a long time ago, unfortunately. So I hope, and if that ever comes up in America, I hope you fight tooth and nail to, to keep it. Because that is what, you know, the foundation of this country was built on. Like, the Ten Commandments I mentioned, 
Ten Commandments was in every single one of your government building courthouses. Everything was governed. Your law was built off of the Ten Commandments. Like a lot, thirty-four percent of like the uh, the documents of our your founding fathers are biblical quotes. 40, 44%, 44 or 34%. That's a lot of quotes from the Bible for like all these documents that your country was built on. And yet, we are slowly letting this slip away. But you're right. In God we trust. Any uh, other eyes? Okay, let's... I can, I can say influence. Because some things or some people may have... Uh, very large influence on you that distract you from God or keep you away from God. Okay. Yeah. So how would you put God first in your influence? God is my uh, best influence. God is my best influence. Yes, I always see God's hand before the God's Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's going back to... Uh, we'll get to kind of that yeah. to, at, at the end. R. Let's go with the R. We're around the... Uh... Go ahead. Um, the first thing that came to mind with resource, like make God your resource, um, whenever uh, you're questioning anything, go back to God's word and see what it says about whatever it is that you're looking to seeking information on or how you should, what you should do, how you should live your life, I would say. Make your biggest resource the Bible. Biggest resource, your, the Bible. Absolutely. I'm going to give you half a ding because it's not complete. I'm caveat to that because I'm American, obviously, and when I married into the church, that was one of the most beautiful things that I saw among the Egyptian people is that by the grace of God, by the grace of God, you know, everything is by the grace of God. Thanks God for this, thanks God for that. Absolutely. So putting God first in your resources or going back to Him as your resource. He's your number one resource. Yeah, sure. and, and I think, I'm sorry, I'm but um, I grew up in a culture, and my family believed it or not, were very religious, you know. But um, they didn't talk about Jesus or God as like being right there in the room with you, you know. They would never say to us, you know, like, they would just say, well, don't do that, it's wrong. But the Egyptians would say, God says you shouldn't, da 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 right? And I think that is just such a beautiful thing, you know, for the kids to hear that all the time, day in and day. Well, <laughs> really bad. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's something that you have to Yeah, so resources. Yeah, perfect. What else? Go ahead. My kind of personal resources, reasoning, like the way we think the process through, like, a situation or a problem. Like, if you have to think about it, like, Okay. Not to look for outside sources when it's not appropriate. Not look for outside sources, sure. Yeah, that's good. Relationships. Relationships, and that's the thing. <laughs> like what she said. Right? Yeah, so. You can kind of put everything. You can put people before that. Right. All of them are great. And again, I purposely didn't fill it out with like other PowerPoints, putting them because. You need to make this personal to yourself. So whichever one is, is going to stick with you the most, that's the one you, you go with. Like there's no, so for me, I, I'm like, you get a ding because it's personal to me. So the finance was personal to me. My interests were personal to me. And my relationships are also definitely uh, personal to me. Um, choosing our friends and choosing who we expose our families to are extremely important. Recent, uh, this past week I was visiting a family up in Toronto and they were, we were in their backyard and like their backyard kind of looks over to their neighbor's backyard. And I'm like, oh, the neighbors have a pool. Like it's a nice pool, it takes the whole yard. I'm like, oh, that's, that's a nice pool or whatever. And they kind of like, they're like, oh yeah, we don't, we don't talk to them or whatever. Like, uh, and throughout dinner they were explaining to me. They were explaining to me that they don't, uh, they got into an argument with them because they invited them to a pool party, which is fine, like a pool party is normally fine, but that pool party had like excessive like drinking and they're okay with drugs and they have young children and they're okay with it. 
So the mother like that I visited told them, look, thank you so much for the invite. But we're, we're it, you know, we're kind of a little bit different. Like we, so we're, we're not going to, we're not going to come. And they invited them a few times. And actually, which, to the fact that it caused a huge problem for them. And that, like, they're neighbors and they don't even speak to each other. And she is trying constantly with them. But the reality is, is I would ask the question, did she do the right thing? And I think we would agree. And I said, well, why didn't you want to go to the party? She's like, I didn't, it's not for me. I'm worried about my kids. I didn't want to expose my kids to uh, like that environment. I know my kids are not going to do anything. They, they were going to be with them at the party. It's not, uh, but they're exposing them to something that may be normal for other people that are not really in line with our beliefs. So relationships is extremely important. In Proverbs 27, 19, it says, what a man is really like is shown by the kind of friends he chooses. This is paraphrased in a different version, but we always say that. We say that like, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. You know, at first I didn't understand. My dad used to say it to me, I'm like, what does that mean? I'm like, I'm right here. You know who I am. Like, you don't need to see my friends to show me who you are. Like, but the reality is it's true. Like we kind of surround ourselves by people. Uh, the type of people that we surround ourselves could tell a lot about our relationships. Even like our families, like who we hang out with, who we want our kids to be around. Uh, you know, we spoke yesterday about like it takes a village to, to raise kids, you know. Who do you want to be in that village to raise your kids? You don't want just anybody. You don't want just anybody to raise your kids. I wouldn't want that neighbor to raise my kids. I would not leave my child alone with, with, that, with that family. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying at the end of the day, I don't believe in what they're doing. So I would not expose my kids to that. So it's the same for us. How we choose our friends and relationships is, is important. A righteous man is careful about his friendships. Also in Proverbs. You want to be righteous? You're careful about the people that you surround yourself to. So what do you do? Is you surround yourself with relationships that have the same foundations around you. Which is, I will put God first. So if we're able to say, I look at a relationship and say, Hey, does this family have God first? Yes? that I want to expose my, my children to it. And we all know people that we kind of like feel uplifted when we're around. So hopefully, first of all, you guys are uplifting people to people. But at the same time, I hope to God that you have people around you in your life that uplift you when it comes to God. Sometimes you love everyone and blah, 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 then we all going to end up in heaven somehow. Mm. So we really have to stop like, our, what is right and what's wrong, according to the Bible. See, like, in, like it's a big issue in the States, like the, the gay marriages and all that. And um, you find it very tough when you talk to like high school kids on how they approach the, you know, the subject. Some of them say, oh, it's fine as long as it's not hurting me, then it's fine. And they, what do you think about that? Like, so, uh, um, so absolutely, we do live like 40 years ago. Well, everybody knew what was right and what was wrong. There was no like this middle ground. Yeah, so I knew what was right and I knew what was wrong. And I would do wrong knowing that I'm doing something wrong. Like that, that was, nowadays it's not like that. Nowadays is... Uh, if it's right for me and it's not right for you, it doesn't really matter. Everything is equal. Every lifestyle is right. Every, everything is okay. Everything goes. I identify myself as a female. That's okay. That's my truth. It's not your truth. I don't, I don't really care. And we need to tolerate it. And this is where like, our kids nowadays are all about tolerating. If you, there's a survey online that says, uh, they ask the kids of today, you think you're more tolerant than your parents? And, they, and it was like 65% says yes. We're more open to new cultures. We're more open to, to people's ideas. We're more tolerant. But unfortunately, the, the word tolerant, we changed the definition of tolerant. Tolerant means that I will show you dignity and I will love you even though I violently disagree with you. I will still show you love and I will still show you dignity, but I violently disagree with you. There's, this is what Christ did. Christ did not, uh, Christ tolerated everyone. 
But he didn't accept their lifestyle. When he went to the Samaritan woman, he didn't accept her lifestyle. He loved her. He showed her dignity. But he didn't. He didn't like uh, say, oh, well, that's your prerogative. You, you could do whatever you want. No, he didn't say that. Truth is truth. And that's where you're right. Nowadays, our society is, is kind of steering away from that. How do, we, how do we fix that? Honestly, it change, it's by us knowing what the truth is. And one of the things that we lack in our society, in, in us as church families, is our Bibles. Our Bi where is our Bibles in our families? Where is the Word of God? How, do, how am I going to defend the truth when I don't even know what the truth is? Like, I know where to find the truth, but I don't know what it is. I, I could find it in the Bible very easily, but I don't know what it is. We need to learn to, like indulge ourselves in the Bible more and more every day. To read with our families, with our spouses, with our significant others. We need to read. We need to read on our own. We need to not read in a way that I'm reading for knowledge just so I could attack somebody in the future. That's not the point of the Bible at all. The point of the Bible is for us to read it in a way that I am receiving solutions. There's a proactive and like a, a reactive solution. There's a trouble in my life I will read the Bible to find the solution. That's reactive. Proactive is you're reading and you're saying like, what are you telling me? God, how do you want me to live? What do you want me to stand up for? Because at a certain point, there's, there's not a... You can't stand up for... You can know what's truth, but it's maybe not necessarily the right thing to stand up for the truth right now. Like there's a different way to do it. Like we were talking about... Somebody yesterday was mentioning that a Muslim family, uh, the husband or somebody passed away in the family and she's like, well, I, I wanted to, to show support and, and this and that. And yeah, show support. Why, why wouldn't you show support and love and whatever? That's what we're called to do. She kind of mentioned like, should I go to the mosque, not go to the mosque or whatever? Go to the mosque. If they have a, they have a, a, a funeral, go. You're showing love. I'm not saying you, you worship what they're worshiping. But you're going to show love to that person. Now, if they can't do that, that's fine. And everybody has to pick and choose their, their kind of like their boundaries. Can, is this going to affect me or not? There's other ways. She doesn't have to go to the mosque. She could go to, and she decided, she's like, I'm not going to the mosque. I'm going to go to the house. Great. She found the solution. That's fine. But the reality is that she didn't judge them based on their wrong decision. She knew what the truth is. But at the same time, she also knows that she has to show love to that family that is suffering, that ha has a loss, because that, that was a loss of a family. We're not going to say that this man's going to heaven. Like, you don't need to get into that conversation. You need to have like, the common ground. And the common ground is love, love for humankind. And this is what, what, what we have to have. So you have to pray for, for discernment in terms of truth. And when can we bring it up? And when can we talk, talk about it? Um, but we need to start first with our families. And I know we're, we, keep, we might be looking at all the Christians in the world and we may think that we're a small group compared to the rest of the world, but we're not. Like this group is not a small group. When you start to teach, you know, you're, you're, if you're a couple and you're with another couple and you start to talk and have these discussions, like that's going to spread. And we're going to continue to spread. And then we're going to be able to raise our children knowing the truth. And they're not going to accept in the future certain things. One of the things you guys had used to have in your courtrooms, I said, the Ten Commandments. Those were all taken down. But recently, there's a judge in Texas that fought for it and put it back up. And he won. So it's not like you can't win this. God could win this. It's just a matter of, are we willing to take that risk to do it? That judge took the risk. And he did it, and he won, and he got the Ten Commandments back on the board. Why? Because that, he knows that's the truth. We got we to gotta be, and he did it in a way that has discernment and, and wisdom and uh, there was opposition to it, but he won at the end. So there is a way to get there. We just got to trust that, that, that it could get there. Yes? Yes, for the R. Go. Yeah, still R. How to put God first in our request? In our request? Very nice. Okay, can you give us an example? Well, I mean, most of what we ask for involves uh, yeah, healing somebody or, or uh, suffering, less suffering for us. Uh, how about personal salvation? 
Uh, or, amen. Or, yeah. Or friends or, or family or uh, mm -hmm. us. Yeah. That's re that's really good. That is really good. And and I think a lot of times we do end up praying like as a laundry list. Not all the time, but we do. But we do forget about salvation. And we do. But the church doesn't. The church prays the seven litanies. You'll hear the tomorrow in the liturgy. And what do we pray? We pray for the salvation of the world. In the old, old translations, it used to be the safety of the world. I'm like, safety of the world? Like, why are we praying for the safety of the world? But then they switched the translation to salvation, which makes a lot more sense when, when we think about it. Like, this is what we care about. We care about the salvation of the world. So, yeah, absolutely. So, if, you, if this is something passionate about in your heart, uh, salvation is definitely one that we pray for. Also, putting God first in rejoicing so many times we rejoice over things that doesn't really matter yeah and if we see what god rejoices for we say heaven rejoices in one sinner other than the 99 yeah and many of our rejoicing doesn't involve anything that god would rejoice for yeah absolutely absolutely i i agree because we've lost something when it came to in the, in the early church, when they used to repent and confess, I don't know if you guys know this, but that used to happen publicly. So where the priest like stands to give the sermon now, that's where you used to stand up and confess and repent in the early church. I know we're all sitting here and saying, thank God, that's not the way it is anymore. But, but the reality is, is, why were they able to do that? Why were they able to stand up in front of people and confess like, if I were to stand here and confess to you guys, I would be confessing, they would be confessing in a way with a big smile on their face. Why? Because they understood what repentance truly is. We think of repentance and automatically our mind goes to guilty and feeling bad for our sins and negative and yuck. Like, all of this stuff. Whereas opposed to repentance, you can't tell me that a sacrament is yuck. Like, that's what God wants us to feel. He wants us to feel, like, guilt. He wants us to feel sorry. This is what He wants. No, absolutely not. Because repentance, it's all about what the word repentance just means, changing your mind. So, like, if I'm looking at this, this laptop, it doesn't make me smile. But I turn around and I see Brett. Like, I'm happy. Got your name, right? Yes, I did it on purpose. <laughs> I just said so. So like I turn around and I see him and I smile now because he makes me happy. This is exactly what repentance is. Is that we are turning, we're sinning, we're sad and we turn around and I'm happy now. Because I have changed my direction towards God. This is what repentance is all about. So yeah, absolutely. We need to rejoice in the right things that God rejoices. And that is truly one repentance. Like when we see a person that comes back to the church family after many years... Our reaction should not be, where have you been? You know, you haven't been here in so long. Our reaction should be to embrace that person with a, a, an extreme amount of joy. We don't care where you've been. All we care about is where you are. This is what we care about. We don't care where you've been. And a lot of times we get a little bit on the nosy side and like want to understand like what happened to that person. Forget about that. Rejoice. Because all God cares about is where he was. The, the prodigal son, when he came back, the father didn't ask him, where were you? He didn't, he didn't do any of that. What he did was as he rejoiced. And he had a party. And this is what we, we need to do. So yes, absolutely, rejoice with, with God. So finance, uh, interest, relationships, rejoice, whatever's sticking for you guys. S, two more. Service. Service, sure. You want to expand? Service to your immediate family, only in a good church, and the other people around you. Okay. That's good. What else? It's not a ding, though. Okay. But it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind uh, is skills, like using your skills um, and everything you do, whether it's your work uh, or service, to give back to God what, from what He gave you, like giving back our talents. That's, that's a really good one. I like it. Still not a ding, but we'll give you a, like a little ding. Um, I have to. Um, the first one is fight, keeping God in your sight, like viewing everything that you're going to do in life through uh, the eyes of God and not through the eyes of the world. Okay, yeah. Um, and also uh, as for surroundings, like trying to 
try to keep a holy environment for your family and yourself. And just a constant reminder of God's presence in our families and our lives so that the kids grow up uh, being exposed you know, to, to, to God as much as possible before they have to venture out into the world. And, and I feel like if you create a godly, godly surroundings for them, that's something that they're going to want to seek. I like that. I like all of them are, they're all amazing actually. Uncle Linden. Jesus is Savior. Savior? Okay. Absolutely. So he is our Savior, yes? What do you have? I have two that kind of go together. Okay. The first one I thought it was sleep. So we shouldn't sacrifice. That's the second one. Uh, you shouldn't sacrifice God for sleep. You can, you can sacrifice all other things in your life. So okay. Like, Instead of going out Saturday night and then going to church late on Sunday, you can sacrifice hanging out with your friends maybe a little later on Saturday, right? But you can sacrifice in all areas of your life to make more time for God as well. So, yes. So I'm going to rephrase that one and I'm going to say S is for schedule. Huh? Sunday. Sunday. Sabbath. Sabbath. Yes. These are all, these are all amazing. And like the purpose of this honestly is for you guys to connect with one of the words and that you're willing to commit to uh, to putting God first in one of those areas. I think the most destructive thing in anybody's life is selfishness. Selfishness. If you are selfish, you put yourself first. And Absolutely. So that is a result of not putting God first in a lot of things. And including your schedule. If you are all only thinking about yourself, yeah. then you, what you're going to do is your schedule is going to be filled with things that you want to do. And that's why when you look at finance and schedule, they say, show me two things in a person's life and I'll be able to tell, say a lot or, or tell a lot about your life, which is your checkbook, your bank book, whatever, your visa statement, your finances, and show me your calendar. If I could see both of those, I could tell a lot where are your priorities in life? A lot of times. Because if I fill my schedule with all these to-do lists, things to do, then my priority is just to check off certain things in my life to make sure that I'm getting stuff done and it makes me feel good that I'm putting that check mark beside the to-do list or I'm scratching something out. It makes me feel good. Again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying a to-do list is bad. I'm saying when it takes over, over putting God first, uh, then that is the problem. So your schedule should be, give also the first part of your schedule to God. We were just talking and uh, we're saying like how some people don't have Facebook here anymore. But the first thing was the reaction was you wake up in the morning and you grab your phone and what? You check Facebook. Whose birthday is it? Who's whatever? Who posted something last night? Who was out late last night? Who was this? Who did put a post that they shouldn't have put a post? Like all of these things, that's the first thing we do in the morning. Maybe not all of us, but there's a temptation to do that. I heard Father Anthony uh, from Washington once say, put your phone far away from your bed. Like, don't use it even as an alarm clock. Go old school. Use, like, old school alarm clocks uh, instead of using your phone. Because he's like, the biggest challenge in the morning is to get up and to pass your, like, to cross your phone. Like, that's, that's, the, that's the first thing. That's the biggest challenge that you have in the morning. So it's important for us to understand our schedule and to give the first, like the first, put God first in your schedule. Whether it's every morning, whether it's uh, before you eat, whether it's give him the time that he needs. Give him the time that, uh, sorry, not that he needs, that we need. Because he doesn't need our time. But we are the ones that need it. So let's remember when we ask about schedule. How, do, how, do, how can we do this practically? Okay, and personally, I'll, here's a little confession. When I became a priest, which wasn't too long ago, you would expect a couple of things. You would expect that my prayer life increases. You would expect that my Bible reading would increase. You would expect my time with God to increase. For me, as a new priest, it was the complete opposite. My prayer life diminished. My Bible reading diminished. My time with God diminished. Why? Because I was being fooled by, well, wait a second. You just prepared two or three sermons. That's your Bible reading. 
for the week. Don't worry about it. You don't need to read the Bible anymore on a personal level. You just prayed two liturgies. You're going to go home and pray again at night? Are you serious? No, no, khalas. No, don't worry about it. Don't pray again. And that was the biggest struggle. So when I came and I went to my, my, my confessor and I told him, I'm like, Abuna, like, what the heck? <laughs> like, I'm supposed to like pray more, read more. Like, this is not like my job technically. Like now, like this is this is supposed to be easier for me. And he said, No, of course you're gonna you're gonna be attacked on the level. And he asked me to do something that I that I personally hate doing, but I do it out of just obedience to him. But also it makes it, he says, make an appointment with God, because I never thought that it was important for me to to block off one hour in the morning or whatever. Because why? Because I think that's limiting God. That's limiting my time with God. But the reality is, is this is the world that we live in. Whether we're priests or not priests, or consecrated, not consecrated, like we live in a world that will fill our schedule up. So if you are not blocking off a part of your schedule in the morning, at night, in the midday, wherever, three times a day you want to block off your schedule, block it off. And say whether it's reading, whether it's praying, whether it's just sitting silent like and being with God, it's important for us to be able to put God first in our schedule. And I'm telling you, like it's not it's not easy. And we gotta be intentional about this. We have to change like our our way of living into an intentional living for God, which honestly we, we thought that it's supposed to come naturally. You have to make hard decisions. It's going to come a time that if you have a child that has, I told you, that has soccer in the morning on a Sunday morning, you're going to have to break your child's heart to, and say, you know what, it's better for us to go to church. We'll make it up. And trust me, the child is going to get over it. The child will get over it at some point. And if he doesn't, you know it's better for his, his eternal life. It, at the same time, like whether it's a job or this or that or whatever, like if it's taking you away from God and from worshiping God, then you need to figure something out. It is better for you to change jobs and to get a less paying job and be able to worship and to have time committed to God than to have the best job in the world that you think pays you everything. It's, 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 it's easier for me to say now, right? Obviously, I'm a priest, so it's easier for me to say that. And it's true. It is easier for me. To say that because now my job is this. Like, okay. I'm so, but I just confess to you guys too that it's not that easy. Like, there is attacks that happen on the flip side. But it's important for us to be able to make those hard decisions. Make them. Make a gutsy decision. There's a bishop in, in Africa. His Bishop Paul. I don't know if you guys know him. But he's the bishop of Africa. And he always says, do something crazy for the Lord. Like, he... He, like he, he's totally missionary like this is a man that left Egypt and went to Africa like to to serve like a place where there's no Coptic people like it's and he says he tells our, our young people our youth all the time do something crazy for the Lord when was the last time we did something crazy it may not it may seem illogical but if you feel that something is pulling away pulling you away from God then guess what your foundation is not being settled properly there's going to be cracks in your foundations. And we need to be able to take hold and rebuild our foundations properly. Why? So we don't have the problems that America's having nowadays or Canada's having nowadays where there's this irrelevant truth or relative truth and uh, true for you, not true for me. This is what, what's happening. It's, 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 we need to take uh, like a chance and we need to change. We need to change and put God first. So in your schedule, try and put, uh, put a time for God. If you're struggling with that, then I recommend, again, speak to your spiritual father. See what he recommends in terms of that. But do it. What, even if you don't like what he's saying, but it makes a little bit of sense, then do it out of obedience. And you'll see. God will, God will bless that. You know, you may need like a 15-minute walk. You could schedule a 15-minute walk with God after your work. So then you work out your spiritual and you work out your physical. Like you go for a walk. What's preventing you from getting home and going for a walk? I know a lot of people that when they drive home, they sit in their car for 10 minutes. They don't do it for a spiritual reason. They do it because they're trying to switch modes, you know. Uh, and the same thing, like I was telling my wife, she, we were looking for a house and they're like, oh, we should get something close to church. And we found something that was like five minutes from church, like walking distance. I'm like, no. No, no, no. 
Not because of privacy, we don't care. We, we'd love having people over. But it was about, there was no chance for me to switch modes. Like from priest to, to dad or to husband. Like I need to switch, switch modes. So there needs a time to decompress. So that drive home could be your time with God. Don't put the radio on. Just sit with God. There's a way that we could, we could fit God and give Him the first of our schedule. Even Jesus felt the need to do this. And so many times you see, it says, very early in the morning, he got up and he went uh, to pray. Or he went to, in solitude. Or very early he went and he went to the sea. The sea was always representation in the Bible. It's representation of disregarding like, the glory of the world and forsaking the world. When you go to the sea, like, it's very surreal and like, it's just like, peaceful there. That's why he was going there. So it's important for us to find a time in our schedule, to put it first that we are, we are just like disregarding everything else and it's you and God alone. Last but not least, or sorry, do you have something? Sir, go ahead. Uh, put God first in your steps. Your steps? Your first step in everything, whether it's morning, dawn, or... Absolutely, yeah? Absolutely. <coughs> Anything else on the S side? Okay. I'm just going to ask that because it reminds me of something that I heard um, mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the radio. Uh, every step that you take is taking either closer to God or farther away. So it's just to add to that concept and just, you know, things that you do about the day is something that's going to be to take my family in that direction. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Important to know what, what God thinks of you or how He sees you. And I tell you, He sees us as sons and daughters. Like, we're, th this is why we're allowed to call Him Father. Like, we don't, like, He's not so distant. Like, he, he is personal and He does love us. And He, like Denzel Washington was saying, no matter how much we are far away from Him or we feel like we've rejected Him, He hasn't. And He never will. There's, there's nothing, nothing that we could do that will make him reject us. T, just for the sake of time. T, last one. Uh, <laughs> no, it's not the ding. It's not the one that <laughs> was scheduled, so that's why there's not time. But time is good. But what else? Let's, let's get another one with T. You said it. I didn't say it. Talents, yes, that's that's a good one. Do you, do you want to uh, do you want to expand? Um, that like God is giving you certain capabilities and things that you glorify Him. So I'm just thinking you you mentioned that you know that you can do all these things and things that you can't do before. So like maybe singing lyrics that glorify God instead of other things. Um, 100 percent, yeah. And it kind of goes with the intellect at the same time. Like we had intellect give back the glory for any talents that you may have. Amazing. Yeah, I like that. The, the teachings are definitely great. Fadonk. Yeah, we thank the Lord for His great mercy. Mercy. Thank you. Oh, thankful. Thank you. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, am I missing something? <laughs> the mercy? Like, I didn't know. Like, thankful. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I'm not going to hide it. Thankfulness is definitely like something huge in me so being thankful in every occasion and we say this in the liturgy we thank you for everything concerning everything and in everything and I think we need to continue it though like why because he has accepted us covered us and supported us and brought us to this hour like all of those things like kind of combined like that's a very strong prayer accepted us covered us like can you imagine like he exposes all my sins to you guys like it would it would be a disaster like I'd want the earth <laughs> to kind of like swallow me up and like <laughs> take me to go but like uh, 
csodik. Temptation. Sure. The temptation is, is very close to a dink. So. I was going to say trials are temptations. So the trials is a little bit closer. How we react to difficult situations or temptations, how we will all definitely go through trials. Like, we can't live as a human being without going through it. So, how we respond often demonstrates how open God goes to A hundred percent. And that, that, that is a dink. So, I had trouble. So, uh, trial, troubles. Absolutely. Put God first in our trials, in our troubles. Because, and I'm going to use the word trials over temptation. In Arabic, it's the same word. Trials and temptation. If you look in the Arabic side, it's actually the same word. They don't differentiate between to get it, right? To get it. So it's, it's the same word. But in English, there's a differentiation between temptations and trials. And one, we, we say, you know, trials are designed by God. To help uh, to lift us up, temptations is something designed by God, uh, by by the devil, to kind of bring us down. So those are the different. So in Arabic, they don't make the differentiation in the word, but we do uh, in English. But definitely troubles, like how we face unexpected problems and pressures in our life. When we are in a crisis, do we turn to God? A lot of times we do. A lot of times we do. But when do you do it? A lot of times, if we're very honest with ourselves, God is not like our first option. God is our last resort. Like we get to a point that I can't do anything physically anymore, so I will turn to God. So my boss at work, you know, has, you know, accused me of something falsely. The first thing that I want to do is prove to him that he is wrong. And I go and print out all my emails and show him that I was doing my work. And do, I do everything possible. And, and he will say, no, no, you fabricated everything. And then when everything else fails, then I go to God and I say, God, please help me with this person. Why is it not our first reaction? Why is it not our first reaction when it comes to trouble? To, kind, uh, to say, God, I need you in this time. God, be my refuge. This, this is our chance for us to lay aside our pride because I want to fix things most of the time but when I fix things it's on a temporary level when I ask God when I humble myself and I say you take you take care of this I will be silent you fix this Pope Shenouda at the time that uh, there was a big uh, there was a bomb I think it was a bombing in church anyways there was like basically there was an attack on the churches and he had his Wednesday regular weekly meeting. Pope Shinola is the previous Pope of, from Pope Tawadros. So they sent him a question and they said, Pope, can you please, Your Holiness, can you please address what is happening, like in the bombing? And his answer was, I choose to stay silent so God could speak. I choose to stay silent so God could speak. What was he doing there? He was a very influential man. He could have destroyed the situation like it, no problem. He was very elegant. He was very wise in his words. He could have. And everybody knew that. He, he was smart. But what he chose to do instead, he decided to give the trouble to God first. And after that, he, he, you, we, we would react. So it's important for us to try and call upon God in our day of trouble and He will deliver us. In Psalm 50, that's what it says. My first even in tough times, is not uh, to ask God, uh, not to try and solve things on my own, but to ask God. We get embarrassed a lot of times because we don't want to ask God in our times of trouble because it seems like we only go to Him in our times of trouble. So that's why if you take a step back and we are talking about schedule and you put Him first in your schedule, then that means we're putting Him in our good times and in our bad times, always first, and we won't be embarrassed. And there's nothing for us to be embarrassed. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. First, seek ye first the kingdom of God. This is what we're being asked to do. Put God first in your life. This is how we create a strong family. Whether And you could apply this 
on any level, whether it's your, your spouse, a couple, your children, your church family, your relationship with God, your single, like your relationship with God, whatever it is, you're able to apply these principles. So I pray that we could put God first and that we become awesome and strong families. Any questions or comments?